Hello, my name is Alex Isles and welcome to the Museum Park Orientalis over here in the Netherlands. Welcome back. So I've been invited over here to the Netherlands for a reenactment event with a group called Fetico, and we are currently doing a reenactment event of the late Roman period over here in the museum park. And this museum park is a fantastic site, and what I really enjoy about it is its history as well, because it started off in the early 1900s as a site for Christian pilgrims who couldn't make it to the Holy Land. So the idea was to reconstruct historical sites from the Holy Land so that Christian pilgrims could have an experience of what it would be like in the first century AD during the life of Jesus and to walk around places like that. So right behind me is the stairs and this is supposed to be Pontius Pilate's palace where Christ was obviously then sentenced in front of a crowd and then obviously taken out to be crucified. And the interesting thing is, is as you look around here, it's a dramatization of what it would have actually looked like. It's not fully histori historically accurate. And that's quite an interesting thing in its own right, because when we think of historical accuracy, when we think of all of these sort of things, we are very sort of, we, well, today we now know a lot more. We've done a lot more archaeological digs. We've done a lot more research. And we know the building materials that these people used back then. So when we know the building materials, we know all of that sort of stuff, we can make far more accurate, accurate reconstructions of these amazing locations. And obviously over time as well, these buildings require funding and it's quite expensive to keep them going. So as you look around, probably if you, as I walk around, you'll see that there's damage and there's been repairs done over time as well. But this has actually, over time, obviously, it was a, a biblical museum park where people could come and experience the Holy Land of the first century. And then over time, it became a museum to the three monotheistic faiths, so to Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. And so then when it became a museum dedicated to those three faiths, it then expanded out and there is a, an Arab village, there is a Jewish village, and this section here represents early Christianity. And then from there as well, it's now developed where it's a place where people can come along and look at the various different cultures through history, again focusing on Christianity, Islam and Judaism. So that's a brilliant thing in its own right and it's now an important heritage site in the Netherlands as well. And there's a protected building site as well where they do add on occasion, but lots of these buildings now protected because they're historical relevance to the history of the Netherlands. And I find this a brilliant, brilliant thought, sort of thing as well, because it's made me think about my hobby reenactment and about how we depict things. Because as you look around here, this probably isn't what Pontius Pilate's palace would have looked like. Pontius Pilate's palace would be far grander. It's a Roman governor's palace. And yet here, this is as good as they could do in the 1900s to represent, so the early 1900s, to represent what Pontius Pilate's palace would have looked like. And over the last couple of days, I've been speaking with other reenactors. And in, within reenactment, there's a big thing about authenticity. So the question is, is should we try and always be as authentic as possible to the Roman period? That's the, for specifically Roman reenactment, which is what our, I do as my hobby. And when we talk about historical reenactment, you know, you've got to think that you've got your your clothing. So do you get someone to sit down and to spin the wool for your tunic exactly as it was done during that period? Then when you've got the cloth, do you have it dyed exactly as it would have been done? So you use as accurate as possible materials to reconstruct that. Do you then have the cloth cut and sewn with the exactly the right type of uh, stitches so that it's all put together in exactly the correct way? And then do you then augment it with correctly stitched belts to correctly made armor, all of these sort of things, correctly made weapons, and then depict as closely as possible the Roman soldier or the, let's say, a Roman civilian or a Roman governor, a Roman slave, whatever your depiction is, do you do that as accurately as possible? Now, there is a lot of reenactors I know who will do everything they can, and some people are going to great extents where they are trying to get um, the actual Mediterranean sea snails to make the purple dye that the imperial family wore. And that's a very expensive procedure, but that's something that I know groups of people are doing. And so when they're doing these sort of things, they're going for full authenticity. 
But there's others of us who, rather than going for full authenticity, go for as close as we can. Because we know that when we've got this archaeology, um, unlike, let's say, other cultures, let's say later on in the migration period or in the Viking Age, where we have full burials, where you can basically take a burial and they've got clothing, they've got weapons, they've got day-to-day -day items, combs, all of that stuff, and it's all in one grave. And so you can look at that and go, I'm going to re reconstruct this particular grave from Norway, and I'm going to be a Viking warrior from that period based entirely on that grave which again has its own problems because the dead don't bury themselves, the living bury the dead. And so when you've got that problem, you know, that's um, a, a stylized, a, um, a perfect, a picture perfect picture, if you like, an image of what the, dead, the, the living wish to represent the dead as they send them off to the afterlife. So it's not exactly as they would have looked during the daytime. It's not as if, you know, you're waking up in the morning before you've had your coffee and, you know, your, your, your hair's still a mess and all of that sort of stuff. No, when you're being put to, you know, into your longship burial, your beard's being combed, your, your clothing's perfect, you know, they've done everything possible to send you off to the afterlife in a way that helps them to deal with their grief, but also feel, fulfills the cultural, you know, expectations of that society. So in the same way, when you're looking maybe the Roman period, we don't have those sort of graves. The Romans practice cremation. So because of that, there isn't like a burial with grave goods where we can go, oh yeah, okay, we're gonna choose that particular grave and reconstruct a Roman exactly from that grave. What we have to do is we have to go, all right, here's an area. So let's say for instance, I do Hadrian's Wall in the north of England. So when I do Hadrian's Wall, I have to look and find all the finds from a specific area. So I try and do the central and eastern part of Hadrian's Wall, and I choose finds, and I go, all right, I'm going to do a third century impression here, a fourth century impression here, a fifth century impression here. And I put together all of the particular finds that when I'm speaking to the public at these events, I can go, well, this belt here, this part was found at Vindolanda, or this tunic here, well, I have had to look at a Germanic tunic called the Fosberg tunic from Denmark, because that's as close as we can do and it's very similar to the artwork and so when you're putting this together your interpretation you know your belt fittings could be maybe 25 to 50 years different to the tunic you're wearing but it's as close as we can actually manage and the other thing to take into account as well with reenactment is that we are not ethnically Romans or even ethnically let's say Britons or Germans or Gauls from that period because obviously there's been a mixing of people over time we have better diets we have better health care we have better dental care we have you know all of these sort of things even our cleaning regimes are different as much as we talk about the Roman bathhouse our cleaning regimes today where most of us will wash every day if not every other day depending on your circumstances we're a lot cleaner than our ancestors and that causes other issues for us as well but um, when we've got all of that sort of stuff going on, you have to understand that we can't actually authentically portray someone from that period because, you know, human evolution has continued. We've, we have continued through the fact that, you know, our parents brought together their genetics and then created us. And so when they did that, we are different to our ancestors a thousand, two thousand years ago. So all of this means that when we're doing reenactment, if you're going for full authenticity, there is always going to be an issue. And especially as well, to all bringing it back to this museum park right here, the idea was to help pilgrims initially who couldn't make it to the Holy Land understand the concept of these places, these sites, and then stand here and go, well, this is what it would have been like for Jesus to stand in front of Pontius Pilate. This is what it would have been like for Mary to walk through the streets of Jerusalem. Um, that's uh, Mary, mother of Christ, um, after her son was crucified. This is what it would be like for this sort of person. And to get someone into a religious mindset so that they could go, wow, you know, this is the experiences they had to bring themselves closer to God. And their, and their faith. In the same way, reenactment is one of these actions where we are trying to bring people back to a period where we are taking historical sources, clothing, items, all of these things together, and we are depicting um, ethnic groups that you know, don't exist in the same way as they did in the past. We are depicting clothing, 
weapons, um, day-to-day -day life, all of these things and putting them together so that members of the public can touch something that is ethereal, that doesn't exist anymore and we can never produce it in a way that is entirely as it was back then. And so we are always going to try and strive to do something that is as close as possible. And it's the same struggle you see in museums, it's the same struggle you see in historical documentaries, all of that sort of stuff. Because so often, you know, when you read a history book, it seems as if history is set in stone. And we know this about these people. But the reality of it is, is that we are clasping air. We're trying to grasp the air and try and go, well, this is a fact that we can hold on to. But the fact can often change depending on where you're standing like the um, trying to understand, well, oh yes, all boat, all Viking ships were like this. Well, then suddenly they discover another one and it's actually like, well, no, no, they're not all like this. Or if we say, oh, well, you know, um, the Romans believed all in this pantheon of gods and then suddenly we find out that the Romans had a very different understanding depending on where they were in the empire of how different gods interacted. And so there's amazing, you know, there's core things that would be true of all societies that we can say, okay, yeah, that's something that uh, the core belief was there for that particular part of society. But the way it's interpreted in different places means there's so much of a change. So, for instance, as I depict a Roman soldier of the 3rd century AD on Hadrian's Wall, a Roman soldier in the, uh, the Rhine frontier of Germany is going to look very different and one in the Middle East is going to look very different because our clothing, our historical finds, our ethnicity, all of these different things will be different depending on where we're standing, but we're all Roman. And if that sort of t helps you to understand in a little way, just like today, if you took a snapshot and then this particular video was filmed in 2022 and you said, all right, um, Europe in 2022, well, someone standing in the Netherlands and 2022 with their clothing, you know, they could be of a particular group of a subculture within our society, depending on their music, their fashion, their personal beliefs, all of those sort of things may look very different to someone maybe from the south of France or Spain. And they'll look maybe very different again to someone in Poland. And, you know, all of these different things come together so that while there is a concept of Europe as a, a, a body, as a, as, a, um, as a political entity, and also as individual nations and different cultures, there is also the differences between those as well. And so that's what I really love about this whole thing here and how this museum park has got me thinking over the last couple of days because there's so many little intricacies that when we're depicting history when we're telling these stories can change depending on where you're standing and how you want to interpret those facts and how yes the striving for authenticity you know when you're looking at this we could go oh, we need to rebuild it depending on the archaeology we have now the technology we have now the building materials we have but there is always the difficulty that one, you know, that can change and two, the cost that is in enacted with that, you know, do you spend a couple of hundred pounds creating a Roman helmet or do you spend five thousand pounds creating a Roman helmet? It just depends on what your understanding of authenticity is and how you want to depict that history to the public. And so that's one of the things there that I hope that while you're watching these videos, I'm trying to explain history to you in a certain way, but there are so many ways of understanding something and I may know a specific area of history, but there's so much more to understand as well. Now, I definitely feel as if this video has gone on a ramble, but I hope you've understood and it's maybe opened up a thinking for you wherever you're sitting in the world that maybe next time you interact with a museum or historical reenactors or a history book that suddenly you can sit down and go, right, yeah, I've read something, I've learned something here. But how does that actually play out with, you know, um, with the evidence we have, what we can learn in the future, and how, you know, in some ways, history is very malleable, it's not set in stone, and how we interpret it and depict it can change as well, just depending on how we learn, how we go, and what resources we have at that particular time. 
As always, I really hope you've enjoyed the video and you would like to like and subscribe, share the video with your friends, and if you'd like to support me in the description below, I do also have my Patreon and Coffee account, but there's no pressure from you whatsoever if you don't want to do that. As always, put, please put questions in the comments and I look forward to just sharing more history with you in another video in the near future. Until then though, stay safe and well and thank you so much for watching. Thank <laughs> you.